All right, well, turn to Acts chapter 8. We're looking at verse 26 to 40, the adventures of obedience. Uh, we were introduced to uh, uh, Philip here a few weeks ago, uh, a young guy that uh, uh, is chosen among seven, along with Stephen, uh, to uh, uh, wait on tables, that is to care for the administrative duties, either food and or money, taking care of widows and orphans. Uh, he and Stephen began their, this, uh, the ministry. Uh, the shift uh, or the spotlight in the narrative, of course, focuses on, on Stephen uh, in our last couple of studies, uh, culminating with him being the first uh, martyr of the church and then to Philip. And we find him up in Samaria uh, doing a tremendous uh, work. There's a citywide uh, revival uh, amongst the people that were very unlikely uh, for the gospel to go to. Uh, but uh, God chooses a, a guy like Stephen, maybe may because he was a Hellenistic Jew, uh, maybe because he knew what it was to uh, uh, walk into Jerusalem or the temple and never and kind of feel like a second class citizen, maybe never feel quite accepted and whatever it was. But God had something that stirred in his heart to cause him to be the first missionary. He's the first guy that takes the gospel cross culturally uh, to uh, another group of people. And uh, we're going to see God now uh, uh, lead him and guide him and remove him from uh, leading this revival, huge revival in a city uh, to minister to, uh, to one person. And we'll note his, uh, his immediate uh, response and uh, his immediate uh, obedience, which uh, leads to the title of the message, The Adventure of Obedience. And it is an adventure in the Lord when we're obedient uh, to him. And of course, it begins with the small things, but there's a, there's a lot of freedom and a lot of things that God can do in and through our lives when we're obedient uh, to, to him. And uh, I, I want to illustrate that with one of my favorite stories. And, uh, and so bear with me if you've heard this before. But uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, quite a few years ago, I had a, I had a dog named Lokahi. He was a half uh, lap, half golden retriever, and he was very smart. And I did all the obedient stuff with him, and uh, uh, you know, puppy, the novice, the advanced, the you know, and and uh, you go every week, you know, and rain, sun, or shine, man, you're you're out there because dogs have to learn to obey even in the rain. So that means we get to train them in the rain. And uh, on one of those occasions, driving to Waikiki at the elementary school there every week where I was uh, doing the training, and look how he's out there, you know, about 75 yards, and I'm giving him up, come, a stop, down, and it's like, I've, it occurred to me standing in the rain that I think we're done here, you know? <laughs> we're not on our way to Hollywood, you know? It's like, that, that's enough obedience right there, you know? Hand signals from 75 yards away, that's, that'll, that'll do, you know? I think we can walk to the park now or whatever, and... Uh, but, uh, but he was a smart, uh, but the thing is, and, and like, uh, it's so fashionable now, you know, it's like, uh, you know, people take their dogs everywhere as long as they'll fit in a basket or a purse. This is kind of this new phenomena. But, you know, at 80 pounds, he couldn't fit in a bag, you know, and, uh, but he still wanted to go with me everywhere. I was getting ready to go to Maui, and I would try to take him with me because he, when I was gone, because he was just with me all the time, uh, he wouldn't eat. You know, I mean, a week, two weeks, you know, and uh, so I was going to try to get with me. And I, of course, the major air carriers, uh, they, they, they want you to put them in a, in a kennel and drug them and all that. So I, I got a hold of a small commuter airline out on Lagoon Drive and said, uh, uh, is there any way, even if I pee a little more, I can actually bring them with me on, on the flight? Sounds like a crazy idea, but you never know until you ask. And they said, well, if he's really obedient and you'll have to demonstrate that. We can do that. So I, we went out the, the, the day of the trip, and I had him there. And the, actually, the pilot comes out, and all right, let's see it. You know, and I kind of take him through. You know, sit, stay, stand. Da, da, da. He goes, wow, that's pretty good. He's on. You know, so we, we get on the plane, and this is one of those with about eight seats. You know, I'm I'm like this. You know, and I'm standing by the window. He's right next to me. You know, sitting in, in his seat. I, you know that expression when dogs actually smile? I mean, they, you, you can just kind of tell they're having a good time. Yeah, I don't know if we're attributing to that to them and it's not going on in their brain, but uh, I, I think you can tell when they're having a good time. He was having a good time. It's the only dog on the plane, kind of looking around, checking things out. He was really quite the character. And uh, so we're riding along. I'm kind of enjoying the, the low, slow flight and checking things out as we're flying uh, over to Maui. And there's a young couple uh, right in front of us, 
probably on their honeymoon or something, and she's got one of those summertime, one of those backless spaghetti strap uh, dresses on. And I, I turned my, I turned just in time to see Lokahi lean forward and lick her right up the back, <laughs> from here right up to the neck. Which, of course, then she turned around and gave me, if looks could kill, I would have been dead on the spot. You know, like, what in the world just happened? And it's like, she's kind of looking at me like, <laughs> like, what just happened? So I was like, I turned instinctively to Lokahi and slapped him under his chin. Bad dog. I wanted immediately for her to know where the blame should be laid. <laughs> the way she was looking at me, this uh, wasn't going well. Uh, but uh, and we were okay the rest the rest of the flight. But uh, Lokai got to go places and do things most dogs never do because he was incredibly obedient. His obedience led to tremendous freedom, uh, and that's what we're trying to illustrate. <laughs> of course, uh, if the more obedient we are to the Lord, and we're going to see some pretty instant uh, obedience and some unusual circumstances here with Philip, uh, but it's the same with us. How God can freely use our lives and use and, uh, and lead us places on some pretty tremendous adventures for him and for the kingdom of God if we'll simply be obedient uh, in the small things uh, with him. We might embarrass him once in a while like Lokahi, but uh, you know what? He'll just kind of maybe give us a little pop on the chin and go, don't do that again, and then, and then just continue to guide uh, and direct our lives. So there's a lot we want to learn here. Uh, from Philip. 2 Timothy 2.15 says to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing uh, the word of truth. And Philip was, uh, was a man like that and well prepared uh, for the life that the Lord had for him. And uh, just uh, again, one other note of uh, apology, no PowerPoint slides, uh, the, um, because I was busy. <laughs> And uh, so we'll, we'll survive without them for one week. All right, but the first point, so you're going to have you're a note taker, and it's not going to be on the screen. I think I got notes for you. As Philip was certainly prepared to obey. Well, let's look at verse 26 to 29. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch, a great authority, and there Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. And Philip said, easy for you to say. No, he didn't say that. But uh, uh, we see this instant obedience. Uh, it didn't begin with an angel, we would say, because it's an angel, the Lord, that, uh, that speaks with him. Uh, and again, just to uh, uh, remember Philip in the, in the beginning, uh, referred to as a, a man full of the spirit and uh, wisdom. Uh, he met the qualifications for this very specific duty to be, basically be an administrator, again, to take care of, uh, of widows and orphans. And as he was faithful in doing that, then God led him to Samaria, a very unlikely place. Uh, a guy uniquely chosen to be the first missionary. But it all begins so very, very simple, with a, a very simple uh, uh, relationship with the Lord. And I, I was reminded of this as uh, we see uh, uh, on the men's retreat so many guys that, uh, from the other churches. It really is kind of like a big uh, family uh, reunion. And I got a chance to, uh, during one of the meals, to sit down with uh, Frank Lau, who, who uh, we've known for uh, a, a very long time, 25 years or probably. And and uh, Frank's uh, been a missionary uh, a lot of places, but spent years in China. So we all, I always try to get together and we talk about China and what's going on and our mutual interest there. And uh, when he's going again, when I'm going again, and we were having one of those conversations. And it, it reminded me of how you know, much the Lord has done in Frank's uh, life and his uh, wife and so forth. But it began uh, at Calvary Honolulu. Uh, he took care of the coffee. He set up the coffee pot because he thought if we had coffee, more people might stay longer. They might fellowship. They might make a friendship, and that would be a good thing. So he just bought, him, he bought, bought himself a little coffee pot and, uh, and started making coffee. That was his first ministry. It was just so simple, and, and God did use it, uh, but just to see uh, how he went on through the years. There's a lot of people that uh, like to quote or maybe a little familiar with uh, Billy Sunday. Uh, Billy Sunday was the Billy Graham of his day a couple of generations ago. Uh, and most people 
that are familiar with him, at least in some degree, know that he was a big-time professional baseball player uh, that left uh, the major leagues uh, in the uh, prime of his career uh, in order to be uh, an evangelist and preach the gospel. But in reality, that's not true. Billy, Grant, uh, excuse me, uh, Billy Sunday uh, left uh, his uh, professional career in the major leagues uh, to take care of guys that had alcohol and drug problems. Uh, he worked in a soup kitchen in an inner city, and nobody knew who he was or what he was doing. But God, God gave him a heart for that, so he left the big leagues to do what he could to, uh, to care for those that were the worst uh, and the most neediest that he could see around him. There was an occasion then when somebody called him and said, uh, Billy, we know you're down there sharing the gospel with people. We're supposed to have an evangelist at our church tonight. Could, would you be willing to come share? And of course, he, he was happy to do that. And then somebody else heard that, hey, they had Billy Sunday and he preached the gospel. And some people got saved, so they called him. And then some other people called him. And, some other, and that led to an evangelistic career uh, that was uh, pretty, pretty epic and pretty huge in terms of the, the history of the church in the United States. But that's not how it began. So we talk about, and an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. <laughs> well, it, it started out with a guy named Peter going, can you wait on these tables over here? And, uh, and he was obedient uh, in the very simple things. And the same will be true of our lives as well. Notice his obedience was certainly a priority. Verse 26, go to the road, go to the south road or the desert. So he Verse 27, started out. So it's not just uh, uh, obedience, it's, uh, it's immediate, immediate uh, obedience. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, only those who obey can believe, and only those who believe can obey. It's very, very simple. You know, if we really believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, and he's given us eternal life, and as we've just sung uh, many songs about the, the rapture, I, I told Mark, I can always tell him when he's had a tough week, because we've got a lot of songs about the rapture. <laughs> we're, we're ready to go. <laughs> and uh, we get a little rapture here in our passage, so this is very appropriate. But uh, uh, yeah, nonetheless, it's, uh, uh, when we think of what God has done for us, what he's doing for us now and in the future, uh, simple obedience should be, well, it should be just the first thing that comes to my mind, but uh, often it's, it's not. Uh, a number of weeks ago, as we were doing the youth group on Friday night, I, uh, I made reference to, uh, to Eric Little and, uh, and everything, and, uh, and I could see that blank, that blank stare that I get sometimes. Never from you guys, of course, but other places. And I said, okay, 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 how many of you have seen Chariots of Fire? None. I said, okay, movie night. <laughs> I'm getting the movie. We're going we're gonna to watch it. We, and we watched it uh, a couple weeks later. Had a, had a great time. But uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't seen it, it is a great movie. Uh, again, focusing on Eric Little, who uh, basically is on his way to the Olympics in 1924. He's been uh, uh, raised in China, where his parents are missionaries. He's gone back to Great Britain, to his, his homeland of Scotland, to complete his education, prepare for the ministry uh, himself. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the film focuses on the contrast between him uh, and another great sprinter uh, named uh, Harold Abrams. Uh, one is one running for his own meaning and purpose and personal glory, uh, and Eric Little is running for the, the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's a tremendous contrast, of course, between worldviews, between having real meaning and purpose in your life and the shallowness of what er Harold Abram says at one point in time, that I have 10 seconds in order to determine my meaning and purpose in life. And of course, he accomplishes that, and he's still left very shallow. Uh, but Eric wasn't able to run, if you know the story, because of his own personal convictions and his Scottish Presbyterian upbringing. Uh, when they're on the boat, on their way to France, he finds out, they find out, that uh, his early heat fell on a Sunday. Uh, due, and he was due to preach in a church at that time, uh, and that was going to come first. So based on his personal convictions, he was going to have to withdraw from the Olympics and withdraw from the race. Uh, one British official said at that time, what a pity we couldn't have persuaded him to run. His coach replied, no, it would have been a pity if we had, because we would have separated him from the source of his speed. Even his coach, who, believer or non-believer, I don't know, recognized why Eric ran, where the drive of his life came from. 
Uh, and here's a guy that was completely obedient to the Lord. Well, the rest of the story is that they put him in the 400. He's a sprinter, but they put him in the 400 because they could. Uh, it wasn't on the uh, on a Sunday. Uh, and Eric Little went on to run the gold medal in in the 400 and on with his life as a missionary to uh, to China. But uh, obedience, only those who who obey can believe. Only those who believe can obey. Philip was one of those men. His obedience led him to the right person at the right time. We might call this the, the, the absolute uh, epitome of a divine appointment. Uh, we'd also note the fact that uh, he had no idea where he was going or what he was doing. Uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of details given to him by this angel. It's just go down to the middle of the desert down here on this uh, road, uh, down in the middle of the Gaza Strip, and just kind of hang loose, you know, and uh, we'll get back to you later, you know. But, uh, but he goes, uh, and, and he does it. Of course, that's one of our issues with the leading of the Lord. Uh, a few more details would be good here, Lord. Uh, but they're not always forthcoming. It's like, well, trust me. Well, trust me. Uh, a couple of steps uh, uh, at, a, at a time. Uh, it's, not, it's not always a bad thing to step out and obey the Lord when you don't know what you're doing. Because then you're really dependent upon the Lord. Uh, I have to tell you, man, when I started teaching the Bible... Everyone was well aware I didn't know what I was doing. Not just me, everyone was well aware. But uh, you, know, you can't let that stop you. And, uh, uh, and uh, Philip doesn't let it stop him. So again, he's, uh, he's down there. This guy comes by in his, uh, his chariot. And uh, a couple of the details that are uh, very interesting about this is that uh, uh, he, uh, he hears the guy reading uh, from the scroll uh, of Isaiah. We're going to read that uh, in just a moment. But uh, one of the things that we miss uh, in the English is that the scroll the guy's reading is in Greek. In other words, he's reading a Septuagint. He's reading a Greek translation uh, of, of the Old Testament scroll uh, of Isaiah. Uh, and the reason that that's significant is because Philip's Greek, he can understand. He put Peter there, John. It's like, what's the guy reading? I don't know. Some like Greek to me, you know, it's like, it would have meant nothing to them. It would have meant nothing to them. God had the right guy at the right place uh, at, at the right time. Philip understood exactly uh, what he was reading. Uh, and most of the other apostles uh, would not have understood a, a word of what this guy was saying. Verse 27, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, one of the things we don't know about him, obviously, uh, you know, we're, we know his official position and so forth, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but we don't really know exactly where he was at the, with the Lord in terms, of obviously, he's seeking the Lord. Uh, he's, he, he's got enough interest to jump in a chariot and go a thousand miles to, to get to Jerusalem, which was the, the epicenter of the, of the worship of God at that time in terms of coming to know him the only way you could come to know him and have a relationship with him and uh, uh, understand some economy of the, uh, of the way that uh, you bring sacrifices for your sins and so forth uh, there in Jerusalem. So he, he's, he's willing to truck, uh, you know, a thousand miles. And, uh, you know, we did mention that his, uh, his, his chariot probably was a BMW and pretty decked out. But still, that's a long ways to go in a chariot uh, if you weren't pretty sincere about your faith uh, in the Lord, which obviously was. What we don't know is, had he become a proselyte to Judaism yet, or is he called what's called a Gentile at the gate, uh, like we'll find with Cornelius uh, as we continue on in our study. There was a lot of men at that time that had come to the conclusion, pretty logically, by looking around, that, uh, wow, there has to be a creator as they look around and see the intelligent design of the universe, they come to realize that we're not living in a polyverse, we're living in the universe. There's only one reality, therefore there's only one creator, there's only one God. Who's, who out there has a relationship or knows how to have a relationship with the one God who's the creator? And uh, that day it was, uh, it was Judaism. So there was a lot of thinking Greeks, thinking Romans and others, uh, that had come to this realization, and they were Gentiles at the gate. They hadn't gone through the ceremonies uh, to convert to Judaism, but they had the belief, and they were seeking, and they were uh, trying to, to know the Lord the best they could. And uh, this, this uh, gentleman was probably uh, in, that, uh, in that category. 
Uh, note he's in charge of the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Candace is not her name, it's a title. Uh, and at least three centuries before Christ, Greek literature had reached this area and again uh, considered a, quote, remarkable civilization. Uh, it's not the Ethiopia of today, it's really southern Egypt, the Nubians uh, that are down there. And we've mentioned uh, before uh, our brothers and sisters who are the Coptic Christians in Egypt being persecuted today trans, uh, tra basically trace their ancestry back to uh, uh, this Ethiopian eunuch who brings the gospel uh, back to them. Two things are at work certainly uh, in this story uh, and both having to do with the sovereignty of God. God was sovereignly working in the life of, uh, uh, of the Ethiopians and this man here and God was sovereignly directing Philip to get him to the right place uh, at, the, uh, at the right time. And again, getting a guy like Philip, uh, taking him from waiting on tables to moving him and to becoming an evangelist, uh, and then removing him from that tremendous work going on in the entire city uh, to get him down in the desert uh, to minister to, uh, to one guy. Uh, and again, it's not a wonder that God um, uh, led him to the Samaritans, uh, but it's a wonder that uh, he pulls him down to minister to one person. So Philip becomes a very important character for us because he's really the first missionary. Uh, and it's very interesting. It was not Peter. It wasn't John. Paul hasn't been saved yet. It's not any of the A apostles. It's just the guy that waited on tables because he's a guy that was willing to go cross-cultural. It was something in him and in his past or whatever that God could tap into uh, and say, will you go reach people that nobody else will reach? Will you care about people that nobody else will care about? Uh, and Philip was, uh, was that man. Secondly, we see that uh, he was prepared, uh, not only prepared to obey, but he was prepared to answer. Uh, and that's in verse 30 to 35. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him the place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. So note Philip is, uh, is listening. Uh, he, he runs up. Uh, and again, that, this chariot probably looked like a big flatbed, not like the Ben-Hur. It wasn't the racing model. You know, it was the, uh, the off-road, a thousand-mile trip model. And uh, so they're not, uh, they're not zooming along. But still, <laughs> you know, picture standing in the middle of nowhere and it's like okay here 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 comes somebody this could be something you know and then he's watching and keep in mind this guy is traveling he's a rich guy i mean he's an, uh, an official he has a whole entourage this is not not like one guy you know going by this is an entourage of people traveling not traveling with him uh and uh, he's kind of watching all these guys and then finally god says oh yeah that's the guy catch up okay <laughs> And he's just kind of jogging along uh, next to the guy. And then he hears him in Greek reading the scroll. And I think he's thinking, okay, this could be it. <laughs> the guy's reading about Jesus' crucifixion here. He's got, a, got, a, got the scroll that he picked up in the Christian bookstore there in Jerusalem. <laughs> now, yeah, you had to have some money to own a scroll like this. And, and the scroll, uh, I've seen the Isaiah scroll. Uh, and uh, it's pretty big. So to be unrolling and be at this passage, uh, Philip had to know, all right, good. now I know why God called me all the way down here. Uh, but notice he, he listens carefully before he, he does anything else, and he's prepared uh, to answer. Uh, our classic verse on this, uh, 1 Peter 3.15, where Peter writes, be sanctif uh, But sanctify the Lord God uh, in your own hearts, and always be ready to give a defense or an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness uh, and fear. Like Philip, all of us are to always be ready uh, to give a reasonable answer, not just knowing what we believe, but actually why, why we believe it. And of course, uh, 
uh, we're doing our best to kind of uh, pour the apologetics uh, into the younger generation because when they uh, they're getting hammered every day at school and uh, and when they get to the uh, secular college university scene uh, the uh, the teachers there some of them uh, their life's purpose uh, is to try to destroy the faith of young Christians and they are being very successful at a rate of 80 percent by the time uh, kids leave our colleges and universities, 80% of them are no longer uh, walking with the Lord. So important, not just for them, but all of us uh, to be able to understand not just what we believe, but why uh, we believe it. And, uh, and Philip was ready. Uh, he was ready to give an answer. Secondly, he was able to answer the man uh, in terms of what he was reading. The question in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? So uh, he met the guy right where he's at. He just didn't hear him. He goes, hey, read something from Isaiah here. Do you know the four spiritual laws? No, you know, you know, you know, the tracks are good and everything. Do you know the six quantum leaps to Christ? You know, you know, you know there, there's some things and methods we can learn you know, to, uh, to share the, the, our faith with other people. And, uh, and tracks can you know, be very effective in, in helping understand the steps of coming to faith in Christ and why we need salvation and so forth. But uh, for the most part, most people need us to just listen. To just listen. Where are they at? You know, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. To a guy that's been born again about six times within Judaism. It's like, mm, that's not going to happen. Well, no, you've got to be born again like it. I mean, he goes right to him with, with language that he understands that has uh, meaning uh, and purpose to the, one, the Samaritan woman. And says, well, you're drawing water, but i got water you don't know anything about. Really? You know, he, 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 Jesus doesn't give a tract to everybody. Uh, he listens and watches and observes it and then speaks uh, a language they can understand and a need that he sees in, uh, in their own, own life. You seem really, really down today. Uh, how are you doing? Wow. Uh, could I pray for you for that? Uh, I haven't been going through what you're going through, but uh, I imagine it's very difficult. I mean, you know, people just need us to, uh, to listen. I got to hear... Um, John Stott, a uh, uh, great British theologian, uh, while well, he was still uh, with us uh, here, in, here in the islands probably uh, 25 years ago or so, maybe 30. And um, I remember uh, he told the story of the first uh, British missionary that came to uh, the Hawaiian Islands, and he came to the Big Island. Uh, and he said that uh, one of the things that impressed him about this gentleman was the fact that when he arrived, he never shared the gospel for a year. He just lived and walked the trails with everybody and sat and listened uh, for a year so he could contextualize the gospel to a group of people that he had never known or met before that. He took his time to listen for a very long time uh, before he ever shared. But he, like Philip, was ready to give an answer to everyone uh, who asked the reason for the hope that lies within. He says, how can I understand this unless someone explains it to me? And of course, the, the perfect passage, it's talking about the willingness of Jesus Christ to go to the cross and die a substitutionary death for our sins. Uh, verse 34, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? A very obvious question. This passage is filled with pronouns, him, he, him, he, all the way through it. Who's he talking about? It's very interesting because uh, there was a point in time when, when Jewish rabbis taught that it was a person. Uh, they didn't understand whether it was the Messiah or not, but many of them thought that it was. But at a point in time, uh, after the rejection of Jesus, at least nationally, uh, it all changed. And if you ask uh, uh, a Jewish person today if, if they actually know the scriptures and uh, if they actually practice their faith about Isaiah 53, they'll tell you and you'll say, who is it talking about? And they'll say, it's us. It's the nation of Israel. It's the people of God. We are the suffering servant. Can you show me that we in the passage there somewhere? It all seems to be first person. You know, they have an issue and a, and a problem with that. But this guy just looked at the scriptures and looked at the obvious meaning. This is talking about a person. Well, who's the person that it's talking about? Uh, God was certainly giving clarity to his own mind. And, uh, and Philip is there, understands the passage, obviously, and is able to start. He didn't end there, but he started with that passage uh, and shares the Lord with him. Uh, what Peter, what Philip was not uh, prepared to do, uh, we see in verse 36 to 40. He was prepared to obey. He was prepared to give an answer. Uh, he wasn't prepared to get raptured, though. 
uh, and that's what happens here. Verse 36, now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Uh, then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. Uh, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So we have this uh, baptism. Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be, uh, be baptized? So uh, again, you have to uh, picture in your mind the scene. This is, uh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, he's the main guy. He's in charge, the whole entourage. And they're all going to wait and watch him go down uh, in the water with, uh, with Philip. A very unique baptism when uh, Philip comes up out of the water and then <laughs> he's gone. And the Lord's taken him in the air. Uh, that's uh, our word here that we see. But uh, again, this man would have been familiar with the idea of uh, being baptized. Uh, if you were to uh, enter into Judaism, you had to be uh, baptized. Uh, there was that other little ceremony that's kind of rough on the guys as well. But uh, the baptism was, uh, was an important thing. Uh, if he had already converted to Judaism and he had been to Jerusalem, like all the Jewish men that are taking their sacrifices up to the temple, they also would be baptized, each one every time. They would walk into the mikvah, they would walk down in one uh, and down into the water and walk out to the other water. They understood that this is a washing away. Uh, my sins are being forgiven. They are being washed away. The water is coming uh, over me. Uh, I'm passing from an old life into a new life. There's a, a direct change that's going on. Uh, this man, would, uh, with his background, at least somewhat in Judaism, would have understood. And so he brings the question up. If I've received Jesus Christ, can I wash away? Can I go through this ceremony? Do we still do this? And Philip says, yes, uh, we, we can do it. If you believe with all your heart, you may. And then he gives this wonderful confession about Jesus being the Messiah, uh, as well as the Son of God. Verse 39 the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And of course, that uh, taking away is the word in the Greek harpazo that we're familiar with, to catch away, to pluck up, to pull away, to be taken by force. And is that same word that Paul uses uh, in the rapture passage in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where uh, Paul says, uh, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall be with the Lord uh, forever. So he, uh, he is suddenly caught up. Uh, he's uh, not taken all the way up, but he's taken and then uh, deposited uh, uh, to the uh, area that we would call Ashdod today. It was about 20 miles away. Uh, and then he journeys on uh, to Caesarea, which is another uh, 60 miles. Uh, and in the, in the process, of course, he's still continuing to, to share the gospel and preach with uh, everybody that he came into contact with. So uh, amazing story about Philip. But there's uh, one more scene. And I want you to, since I, I don't have slides today, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, we're going to read verse uh, 8 and 9. This is 20 years later. Uh, and when Philip will come back into the scene in the book of Acts at this time, uh, of course, by now, uh, Paul has uh, entered uh, the narrative and the spotlight has been on him and his missionary exploits for some times. And there it says, on the next day, we who are with Paul, and of course, this is Luke writing, he's with, with Paul. On the next day, we who, are with, uh, who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now remember who Philip is. Uh, Philip is uh, the buddy of a guy named Stephen, a guy who the Apostle Paul took a, a, a real active hand in killing 20 years later, 20, 20 years before. So it's Saul of Tarsus. They're holding the garments, uh, breathing out threats, uh, and takes part in, uh, this is your friend. And now the guy that killed him 20 years before has now become a Christian. Do you welcome him into, into your home? Philip does. He welcomes him into his home. That had to be quite deceived. And I'm sure that uh, Paul was familiar with, uh, with Philip. 
uh, and uh, as an evangelist, the first missionary that, uh, that really goes out cross-culturally. And uh, in some ways, uh, the Apostle Paul is kind of following in his footsteps, not, not the other way around. And I'm sure Philip has heard all the stories about Paul and all the good things God was doing. And here are these men that could have uh, had, uh, you know, some anger and some bitterness and some hard feelings. Uh, obviously, that, that's not the case. Hospitality, bring him in, part of the kingdom of God, brothers in, in Christ. Mentioning his four daughters who apparently had the, uh, the gift of prophecy and how the Lord now has uh, blessed him and uh, raised his kids up to, to serve the Lord as well. So uh, a great story about how uh, God will, will take us if we're willing in obedient uh, in small things uh, to lead us on an adventure uh, in, uh, in this life. Uh, I, I would hate to think of life being about trying to earn enough money to pay your bills every month and that's it. And if you can, you can squeeze a little fun in on a weekend once in a while, then you're ahead of the game. Uh, I, I would hate to think that uh, that's, uh, that's all it is. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of freedom that, that's in Christ, free from a world system that says this is what it is. If you don't have this much money or this kind of position, you've never succeeded. Uh, this world knows nothing about true success. And certainly we sometimes don't even know what true success is in terms of the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, we were calling the shots. It's like Philip's there, big revival. You stay right there, buddy. I don't think any of us said, no, the measure of success will, will is if you can get the one guy and minister to him. And if you kind of fade to black after that, you've done all I need you to do. You know, God, God just looks at success and this uh, ministry of success very, uh, very different. The economy of God is, uh, is very different. And certainly that's one of the lessons here. Uh, secondly, how often we miss the opportunities to share the gospel uh, because we're just not listening to those around us. And, uh, and that's one of the things we learned from Philip as well. And then to be able to give an appropriate, an appropriate answer uh, to those because we've been listening uh, to those around us. And then thirdly, uh, Philip's obedience gave his life an adventure, not just in evangelism, but sharing God's, uh, God's love and his grace, I'm sure, in, uh, in many different ways. Uh, a number of years ago, I read this little story, and I've read several uh, books on Hudson Taylor uh, and his uh, ministry of the China Indian Missions. Uh, in October 1857, uh, when, and when he arrives uh, to the Ningpo uh, uh, area of China, uh, he's able to lead uh, Mr. Nairi to Christ. Uh, the man was overjoyed and talked about the fact that uh, he had been longing and seeking for God for, uh, for so many years. Uh, keep, keep in mind, in terms of the Chinese, uh, if you're Chinese, you might find this interesting, but uh, Chinese is an ancient culture uh, like, like the Jews. Uh, they can trace their ancestry back and their culture back about 4,500 years. Uh, from, from about uh, 2,500 BC, uh, right up almost to the time of Christ, they all believed there was one God, there's a Chinese, one God, and he was the creator. Uh, they, uh, uh, and their sin had separated them and there needed to be a sacrifice uh, for, for that sin. We've actually been to the Temple of Heaven in Beijing where one of those ancient emperors built a temple to the God of Heaven who was the Creator, who was the one God. And once a year, he as the priest king would sacrifice a bull, take its blood and pour it out uh, on an altar to, to try to somehow atone for the sins of the people and pray to the God of Heaven that they would bring him further, further revelation. Uh, unfortunately, about 6 B.C., about 4 B.C., Buddhism arrives uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, Taoism arrives uh, in China. Confucianism arrives in China. And, uh, and that message then gets mixed uh, until the gospel shows up uh, later in, uh, early on in the, in the second, uh, second century. But here's a guy that uh, has that understanding of the God of his, his forefathers. Uh, and the fact that uh, now he's come to know that God that they all long to know. And he's so overjoyed. And he asked Hudson Taylor then, this is 1857, he asked him, how long have you known this good news in England? And Hudson Taylor says, we've, we've known for centuries. And he said, well, my father was seeking the truth all of his life. He died last year. Why didn't you come sooner? It's a pretty good question. There's a lot of people out there that uh, are, are like, like the Ethiopian this, you know, this gentleman who uh, has a very important position. He's 
doing what he can. A pretty religious guy, seeking God, trying to read, read something about him, trying to figure it all out. He just needed one guy to come along and that's, you know, I don't, I don't think Philip said it's a no-brainer, but that's Jesus we're talking about there. And he's just very simply able to lead him to the Lord. Some people are tough to reach, aren't they? They're just, <laughs> you try to share the gospel with them, and they get angry. Uh, but I want to tell you, that's not everybody. That's not everybody out there. And it's not to say that we can't reach those people, but uh, if we'll listen and be attuned, uh, if we'll be obedient to the Lord in, in the very simple things, it's amazing the adventure and the opportunities he'll give us. Amen. like you, Lord of heaven, King of glory, throned in majesty, you are holy, you are holy, you can fathom all the riches of your mercy, of your faithfulness, you are All is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song 
For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to a heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. King of endless word, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things are. You're lugging into my heart. I'm coming back to a heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. When it's all about you, it's all about you. To turn the timeless wind, wild skies call, wild cries, wild hope reaching away, wild skies call, wild cries, wild hope.
on the helplessness of failing way beyond the scars way beyond the reasons and the ways of our hearts wild skies calling wild strength of your love Lord you have come broken the chains of all the wrong that I've done taken the pain in my heart and given to me your sweet sweet love all of my days for the rest of my life I want to live in your abiding life. I know with your peace in my heart, I'll be standing strong. I will be ready when you come. I'll be in your strong love. At the end of the age, when the stars are falling out of the sky, the 
to fly.